So we are going to record this presentation and the recording will be available after the uh, presentation on our YouTube channel. I will send out an email of its availability. Uh, please write your questions or feedback in the chat box. And uh, at the end of the presentation, either e I or uh, Professor Pearl will go over those. Uh, with this, let me introduce our speaker, which is uh, Professor Judy Pearl. Uh, Professor Judy Pearl is a Chancellor Professor of Computer Science and Statistics. He's the Director of the Cognitive Systems Laboratory at UCLA. He conducts uh, his research in artificial intelligence, human reasoning, and philosophy of science. Uh, he is the author of uh, many uh, great books. Uh, these are uh, some of those are heuristics from 1983, probabilistic reasoning 1988, and causality 2000 and 2009. He is the founder editor of the Journal of Causal Inference. And among his long list of awards, a uh, few I'm listing, uh, the Lakota, uh, Lakotos Award in the Philosophy of Science, the Ellen Newell Award from the Association for Computing Machinery, the Benjamin Franklin Medal, the Rummel Hart Prize from Cognitive Science Society, the ACM Turing Award, and the Grenander Prize from the American Mathematical Society. And these are just few of them to list. Uh, he is the co-author of the book of Why the Science of Cause and Effect, which brings causal inference to a general audience. It's uh, uh, co-authored with uh, Dana McKenzie. And by the way, if you uh, know his statistics, and uh, I assume that because you are in this uh, uh, in this uh, presentation, so. I assume that you know a little bit of statistics. You might have heard the Bayesian network. Well, uh, the person behind this terminology is uh, Professor Pearl. And another historic reference to uh, uh, him is uh, his PhD thesis from 1965, the vortex theory of superconductive memories. Uh, the term Pearl vortex is famous or it's popular among physicists to describe a type of superconducting current. So <clears throat> we are lucky to have him today to speak to us with uh, today. And therefore, without much to you, uh, let's welcome Professor Pearl. Professor Pearl. Well, thank you, Tesh. It's uh, great to be here. I would like to uh, first uh, thank you for inviting me and giving me the, the chance to talk to my own colleagues from my own university. Uh, this is a, a unique opportunity because uh, uh, as they say in the Bible, uh, one is not a prophet in its own village. Uh, so I, let me explain to you why I requested to speak at this forum. I've been getting a weekly announcement from uh, Didre, from Idre, uh, and um, announcing various uh, symposia, uh, workshop, uh, guest lectures, and so on. And as I looked at the content, I haven't seen the word causal inference mentioned. And then I looked at what Idre is uh, doing and what its um, goal and charter is. And I found that uh, it's very similar to what I am interested in, namely data science or extracting knowledge from data. And I said, hey, we are working on the same problem. But I have a totally different perspective of both what data science is and where it's going because I have been working in causal inference for three decades. So perhaps there is something, there is a mismatch and it is my responsibility to uh, confess 
to my colleagues where I see things going. And this is what I'll try to share with you. Okay. So my agenda is captured by this uh, outline. <clears throat> I will first talk about the way I see data science. Okay? We are all familiar with its successes. We are all familiar with its limitations. And there are tensions within data science between two paradigms, which I will uh, expand more in details. <clears throat> we are familiar with the successes, the tremendous successes in the area of the vision in the area of natural language processing, uh, self-driving cars, and so on. Uh, we are also familiar with limitations because we keep on reading um, the uh, critics of data science and of big data saying it's brittle and it's not generalizable and it's not explainable and it's black box. And there are all kind of uh, uh, derogatory words is toward the um, limitations of data science. And um, it, it so happens that in my little corner of causal uh, reasoning, we play, we, yeah, we tinker with toy problems. And the beautiful thing about toy problems that you can tell when limitations are just a matter of difficulty, or they are, they represent fundamental theoretical limitation, which is uncrossable, unless you change your paradigm. And that is the main role of causal reasoning. In our little corner, we have found the difference between just dif technical difficulties and basic parad paradigmatic limitation and barriers. So this is the main topic. And if you get nothing else from my talk, except this distinction, I, I consider my uh, effort uh, successful. So I will talk about the causal revolution. The causal revolution is uh, the uh, transformation that we have uh, uh, went through from the paradigm of data fitting to the paradigm of data understanding. Okay. Then I will talk about the ladder of causation. This is the Rosetta Stone of causal inference. It's a ladder, a hierarchy of three level of understanding from um, that pinpoint the barriers of going from one level to other and um, which represents the theoretical barriers I was talking about. And then I'll come to some practical application, telling you what the um transformation of causal thinking what is the, the, the what the causal revolution that i'm talking about can offer to practical data sciences i have some image of what you are trying to do what a practical person in the that data science is trying to accomplish and i'll try to translate the um, advantages and the tools available in the um, it emerge from the causal revolution down to your level. I have tried to eliminate all the equations. So I'm going to talking only about conceptual level and try to walk you through some of the tools to represent the problem the way it is being faced by a scientist, the question that the scientist faces, and the solution offered to you by the, by the causal revolution, 
which enables you to do things today which were, which were not doable, not even articulable three decades ago. Then I'll, if I have time, I'll go to future direction, which involve blue skies, uh, aspiration, like automated scientific of exploration in going from population to individual decision. And here I am back to data science and the clash of the two paradigms. The major paradigm, the one that you see in big data, in machine learning, in statistics is that of data centric paradigm. Namely, all wisdom comes from the data. And the job of the data scientist is to manipulate the data, to uh, transform it, to reason about it, so as to extract the knowledge which is hidden there to make it useful. So it's good how best to fit the data so as to maximize success on the training set. It's always on training set because there's no other input accept the data. Even for those people who are doing um, future prediction on the basis of past performance and they split the data into two parts, they're still measuring their success on the training set because the part that is being split is still in the data. So this is the paradigm which I call data centric. All wisdom come from the data, as opposed to the scientific paradigm. The scientific, I call it scientific, first to elevate it to something more respectable. And second, because if you look at the way science progresses, this is what the scientific approach means. You <clears throat> don't talk about the data, you talk about the world. <clears throat> there is a world outside the data which has generated the data. <clears throat> and you ask, what should the world be like so that I can answer research question about what? About the world, not about my data. So <clears throat> we are talking about the same thing, except perhaps in different terminology. And this will come to a clear and the clear um, uh, Mm, uh, representation once we get into the details of what we mean by extracting knowledge from data, which I took, by the way, from Idre Manifesto, okay, which I would like to transform into extracting understanding from data. Why? Because knowledge is too broad. broad. Even uh, uh, the, the number of samples that you have is a piece of knowledge, but it, it is not what we really want to extract from the data. The number of variables that you have is a piece of knowledge, okay? but, but you don't want to uh, assign to it, um, the, to elevate it to a level of understanding. So I prefer to talk about understanding because I can give understanding a formal definition. If you are with me at this up to this point, I'll go to what I mean by understanding. What do we, what kind of capabilities do we assign to a system which claims to understand something, whether it is a robot or a human being? If you feel that you understand something, a domain, right? Uh, it's a state of knowledge. It evokes in us, human being, a sensation of being in control. If I understand how a TV works, I can turn the knobs and get the right channel. If I understand how a uh, light bulb works, right? I can turn the switch and expect to fight light and if it doesn't work, I know how to change a, a light bulb. I know how to repair things when I need to. I'm in control 
because I understand how things work. So understanding gives you this sensation of being in control. To be more specific, what it means is <clears throat> you should be able to predict future events from past observation. If you see uh, <clears throat> a mouse at this location and you are an owl, you know where to expect the mouse a second later. Okay. You can predict consequences of contemplating action. As we saw before, if you turn the switch, you expect to find the light there. But moreover, you also expect to provide explanation. Why don't you find the, why is, isn't the light on when you turn the switch? Ah, perhaps the light bulb is burned. And you expect to imagine alternative world <clears throat> or roads not taken. What would have happened had I not taken aspirin? Would I still, would my headache still be cured? <clears throat> Oh, <clears throat> excuse me, let's continue. And more and more, you can attribute to the state of understanding more features which are currently not uh, implemented. A design of new experiment, seek new observation, control your attention into the right variables, into the right observation, satisfy your curiosity. And this is something that children have, which monkeys do not have, except with a few uh, exceptions. Right? And children are triggered and they, they continue to um, playful manipulate their toys until they reach an understanding of why this toy makes a noise and this one doesn't take a noise, even though they don't get any return. They don't have any payoff. They don't stop. They are constantly restless until they understand how the toy world works. This is something you don't find in lower animals. Okay. And come out with, so we, under, we understand now uh, the richness of being in a state of understanding. It's not only for children's stuff. Being a, a I'm going now to translate into something more practical. Look at the kind of questions, practical questions that demand understanding. Okay. How effective is a given treatment in preventing a disease? Was it my tax break that caused our sales to go up or our marketing campaign? It's extremely important because we know where to put the budget of next year? What is the annual healthcare cost attributed to obesity? Can hiring records prove an employer guilty of discrimination? Notice that I'm uh, <clears throat> painting in yellow certain verbs here, certain relationships. I'll tell you why. I'm about to quit my job. It is a personal decision making. Okay? I'm about to quit my job. Will I regret it? Now, I have highlighted those relationships in yellow um, because they have a unique properties. What are they? I first, I recognize them from five miles away because I have been training myself to see where <clears throat> important questions that relate to causality lies, and they have a special character. You cannot express this question in the standard vocabulary of science. I'm not talking about solving the problem. I'm talking about expressing them mathematically. It, the language of science does not permit us to do it mathematically. Why? Because the grammar of science is handcuffed by the symbol of equality. If F is equal to MA, is A is equal to F off of M. <clears throat> if Y is equal to AX, 
then x is equal to y over a. Equality is a symmetric relationship. And the science doesn't allow us to distinguish the asymmetry which is embedded in each one of those causal relationship. So if I have, for instance, y being the deflection of the barometer and x standing for, standing for the, um, bar, the uh, atmospheric pressure. Okay? We, you and I understand that uh, the atmospheric pressure causes the barometer deflection and not the other way around. That because we are supplemented with our understanding of cause effect relationship, what science has deprived, it, deprived us of on. The science is talking equations and we supplement it with our understanding that if you manipulate the deflection of the barometer, you are not going to change the atmospheric pressure and you are not going to increase or decrease the chances of rain tomorrow. Okay. So <clears throat> this is the crux of the matter. Changing, going from equality sign to assignment problem. In computer science, we use an arrow or some other symbol to distinguish between equality and between an assignment. Assignment is what nature is doing here. Nature is looking at atmospheric pressure and assign a value to the barometer to deflect, not the other way around. We, you and I can do it, but it takes a stupid robot to tell us that something is missing, that the equality sign is insufficient because a robot given only the equalities, we'll try to manipulate the uh, barometer, hoping to change the weather tomorrow. Okay. So it takes a stupid robot or smart computer scientist to alert us that we have a limitation here that we need to overcome. The first person who noticed this limitation and had the gust, guts to assign a new symbol for cause-effect relationship was civil rights. He was a geneticist in um, um, 1920s, started in 1918, who experimented with guinea pigs. And he was the first to assign an arrow to the causal relationship. He wasn't satisfied with the equality sign. Here is uh, civil rights <clears throat> depicted next to his, his uh, blackboard. And according to legend, he was so much in love with the guinea pigs that it sometimes he wiped the <laughs> blackboard with his favorite guinea pigs. But his claim to fame lies in this kind of diagram called co uh, causal diagram, and he called it path diagram. And look what he did. First, he said, I'm not interested in the correlation between the fair color of the parents and the fair color of the, um, the descendants. I'm interested in the causal relationship between them, therefore, I'm going to put an arrow, an assignment, and I'm going to put coefficients there on the arrows here. And I'm going to ask myself how my correlations depends on the value of those coefficients. Okay? This is the first time in the history of mathematics that somebody gave a voice, a formal voice to the causal relationship as distinct from correlation or equalities. Okay. He was successful to relate these coefficients to correlations, observed correlation, and invert the matrices there and find the correlation, the values 
of these path coefficients is of as different from the correlation coefficient. And he was immediately attacked by the statisticians of the time in saying, how can you claim to be discovering correlation out of uh, discovering causation out of correlation? Well, we all know from Carl Pearson that, co that uh, causation is nothing but correlation. Okay. So why was he attacked? Up oh, here we are. <clears throat> Because if you look at the history of statistics, and I start with 1834, this is the date <clears throat> where the Royal Statistical Society has formed and wrote in his manifesto that we are not going to publish any paper which contains opinion. We are going to publish only papers which contain data and data and data. Opinions is for the birds. <clears throat> um, and Carl Pearson after that said, there is nothing in, uh, uh, causation is just a species of correlation. Everything is given to us in the contingency tables. And Fisher summed it up so nicely until very days. This is a statement of Fisher, which uh, the paradigm that still rules the thinking of most statisticians with the exception of a few uh, awakeness, uh, awaking. Um, so the object of statistics, said Fisher, is a method in the, in the reduction of data. Seeing it in a different perspective, And from that on, statistics were defined, statistical concepts were defined as those that are expressible in terms of joint distribution of observed variables. Even the Bayesian thing amounts to that. And all others were considered to be outside the province of statistics. What are all the others? They will name substantive matter, domain dependent, sometimes derogatory terms such as metaphysical or ad hoc and so on. These were outside the province of statistics. You can read the entire, the entire literature of statistics in the 20th century. And you find whenever statisticians come to a substantive matter, the idea is this is substantive matter it's a, it, it's it's up to domain depend the main expert to deal with not us okay so essentially they rule out all the interesting questions that a statistician really cares about these are the research question that every statistician has in mind when attacking the problem <clears throat> there's a slow awakening by Neyman and Rubin, which I will talk about later. And it was also, <clears throat> but the result is a total causal phobia in statistic education. And you can see it until today, if you get to any of the, um, the recent textbooks on statistics and you open the index and try to find something about uh, causality, and there isn't anything in the index about causality, except for had the mention that correlation is not causation. Some of the advanced one will even go to Simpson paradox. And that's it. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> I like to think about it in terms of the limitation of um, Plato caves. The players look at the two dimensional shadows on the screen, not knowing that they really are generated by three dimensional object behind the scenes. Okay? So statisticians are dealing with the calculus of shadows rather than the calculus 
of three-dimensional object, but this is just a metaphor. The distinction between statistical associational concepts and causal concepts are very sharp. Here I listed a few notions or relationships and which I appear in the literature and you're all familiar with. According to our definition before, okay, you can classify them very easily into a causal versus associational and they do not mix. They are very clear and sharp distinction between them. Take even for instance, things like um, um, range of causality or collapsibility, or let's take spurious correlation. It's correlation, right? It has been around as a, as a dilemma since 1998 when Pearson discovered that and he said, what is spurious correlation? It's a causal notion. No wonder that it took a hundred years to define what spurious correlation is. What's the difference between true correlation and spurious correlation? You cannot define it because it's a causal notion and so on and so on. Take for instance, confounding. Every statistician know, know that you have to get rid of confounding, but you cannot define what confounding is in the language of statistics. Why? Because <clears throat> of what Cartwright named, no causes in, no causes out. You cannot <clears throat> find any causal conclusion without either, uh, without having causal assumptions or experiments. And that also tells you that the language of statistics must be expanded. You cannot express those notions in the language of statistics, which, which is joint probabilities or whatever is derived from joint probability of observed variables. So we need to have a non-standard mathematics. The pioneer was civil rights. He put an arrow. The counterfactual language, the um, philosophers came out with the language of um, possible worlds. But <clears throat> let's go back to the causal revolution. Once the language has hit the stage and became part of a researcher's tool, set of tools, <clears throat> an explosion took place. New results came that were not, were not possible a decades ago. So Gary King, uh, a political scientist at Harvard, put it very uh, clearly. More has learned about causal inference in the last few decades than the sum total of everything that had been learned about it in all prior recorded history. And a very sweeping uh, statement. <clears throat> but it's so true and it manifests itself in a um, in quantitative terms. <clears throat> For instance, in the JSM, the main statistical meeting okay, um, of 2003, you find only three papers which had the terms causality in their abstracts. Okay? In JSM 10 years later, 130 papers. Today, in 2022, you have dozens of causality specific workshops and conferences. Okay? And I, as I said in my abstract, it's the hottest things in machine learning because of this new uh, ability and tools that are popping up and this new solution that are being proposed, okay? And uh, <clears throat> you find it, it's really fun to find, to be able to do things that Neiman and Pearson could not do and Fisher could not do, okay? With a few basic tools of mathematics. It's a terrific fun. 
for at least for me. It's profit. Many companies are being formed and I keep on getting um, requests for con to consult to companies who just have happened to um, get funding for 400 million dollars or whatever, okay, for new companies that does uh, causal reasoning as opposed to ordinary uh, machine learning, okay. And education, <clears throat> in education, um, we have at UCLA, for instance, we have at least three courses that I know of that uh, are labeled causal reasoning. It's no longer a liability. It's a pride to be able to work in uh, uh, causal reasoning. And um, for me, it has another, or for us, in artificial intelligence, it has another advantage because it is a, a playground for emulating ourselves, for emulating how the way our mind works. But that may not be enough of an, in, of an incentive for you people, which I wrong, perhaps wrongly perceive a few of a practical uh, uh, scientist. So let me go to now to the main, to the Rosetta Stone. The, these are three levels of reasoning, which are, which um, describe the theoretical barriers between uh, the, um, the um, sort of barriers upon the capability of any reasoning system. I call them seeing, doing, and uh, imagining. I should really call it the ladder of knowledge. Okay. <clears throat> they form a hierarchy. A hierarchy means that you cannot answer questions in level I until you have information from level I or higher. So you cannot answer question about doing what will happen if I take aspirin? Or will my headache be cured? Or what if we ban cigarette if you only have correlations? Okay. This is the barrier we're all familiar with. This is the barrier of uh, the causation is not correlation. Okay. <clears throat> There's another barrier here. The barrier between level two, which has do with in, uh, doing intervening and counterfactual. It's I imagining things, imagining things backward, retrospection, understanding. What if I had done things differently? Was it the aspirin that stopped my headache? Would Kennedy be alive if Oswald did not kill him? <clears throat> What if my uncle who died and smoked had not smoked for the past two years? Or to be more dramatic and more uh, <laughs> relevant, what if my uncle who died from Corona has taken, uh, has been, been agreed to be vaccinated? So these are going backward and they involve counterfactual. And I explained to you why I call this counterfactual and not this counterfactual. These are real, involve real contradictions between what happened and what we imagine that could have happened. It's a road not taken. And I, the best way I can do it is by giving you the examples in, in a minute. Okay. <clears throat> Now I'm going to the seven wisdom. Sometimes I call them tools of the causal, causal inference, telling you what we can do with the uh, transformation that took place that we could not do three decades ago. Okay. Tool number one, we can encode causal information in transparent and testable way and I'll show you how transparent it is and how testable it is in a second once we go to the example. 
And let's not underestimate the importance of being able to articulate mathematically and transparently what, um, what we know about the scientific knowledge that we do possess and to predict the effect of actions and policies. We talked about it and I'll show you examples. To compute counterfactual and finding the causes of effect as opposed to effect of causes. The key would be attributing responsibility to act in the legal domain, to find explanation for events that happen, to, to find how susceptible patients have for certain um, treatment. Tool number four will be to compute direct and indirect. We also call it mediation analysis. And this has <clears throat> extremely important in today's <clears throat> analysis uh, of social impact of computers. We are all concerned about discrimination, about inequities and about fairness. The tool number five will be integrating data from diverse sources. This is something that I found even in the manifesto. It says researchers enjoy the new freedom to combine, combine data from variety of sources into a single data set. So it's part of our desiderata. We all want to combine data from diverse resources. But as I, I hope I can convince you, you cannot do it without causal tools. It's undoable, mathematically proven undoable. Okay. <clears throat> and here are the question, the key qu uh, pro word will be fusi, fusion. How to fuse data from a variety of experiments run under different conditions, perhaps under different kind of uh, populations and come out with the conclusions about perhaps even totally different population someplace in Arkansas. It has been a stumbling block for deep learning called transfer learning. I want to transfer what I learn into a different domain. We also called it transportability. We also called it in the social science, it has a name um, external validity connected with the word of Campbell and Stanley in uh, 1963. Okay. We want to find out under what condition our results would apply to a population or to condition which are really implemented in the field from a laboratory to the field. And those turns out only lately to be hindered by basic theoretical limitation that requires causal reasoning, no escape. Then recovering from missing data, if I have the time to talk about that, this is an area where <clears throat> inflict each one of us, every practitioner, the missing data problem, it turns out it's a causal problem, not statistical problem. And then causal discovery. This is the art of um, screening out, finding incompatibility between data, pruning out models that do not fit the data, selecting only those that do, that are compatible with the data, representing them, the set of compatible, and discovering those which are um, both compatible and which um, answer the question that we want to answer. Okay. It uh, has picked up momentum in the past decade because of new asymmetries that can be defined in the data. Okay, I'll start with tools one and tool two. Oh, I'm running out of time. What can I do? <laughs> But you don't want to miss the tools. The tools are what you can use, right? So <laughs> I'll go to encoding. <clears throat> I'll walk you slowly into the kind of 
uh, exercise that describe your state of mind, which I, I believe it's your state of mind. If you are a practitioner and you have to answer a question about um, predicting the effect of action and policies, here it, uh, here, you, here it is. I took it from uh, a paper by Schier and Platt, uh, two uh, research, two um, uh, sport, sport medicine researchers. <clears throat> Try to find out is if warm up improve uh, or um, uh, increase the risk of injury or decrease or decrease the risk of injury. So you have some, here's a dilemma. We all start with that. We have an idea that some way warm up goes through some unknown process and affects injury, the likelihood of injury in some way. This is our state of mind when we are presented the problem, okay? But we also know that, wow, there are dozens of factors that affect, um, that I can think about that makes a difference. I, I can, I, I have a data consisting of games that have been played. Some of them had warm up, some of them didn't have injury and some of them did. <clears throat> Each one was conducted under different condition and I can imagine, uh, <clears throat> and I have many factors that may affect both the uh, warm up condition and the injury. And I know that <clears throat> previous injury makes a difference, coach experience makes a difference, fitness makes a difference, and they're all a big mishmash in my mind. I don't know how they, I know that they make a difference but I don't know which of them I should measure. Some of them are very hard to measure. Some of them are easy. Could we spend the resources to measure them? Moreover, so which factor to measure is the first question that comes to my mind. Here they are. Not only, uh, <clears throat> assuming that I did measure them, should I consider them? Should I, which factor should I adjust for? Another question, to adjust or not to adjust. Some of them are good to adjust and some of them are bad. Well, it turns out all these questions can today be answered to you by the, um, <clears throat> by a technique called backdoor analysis. And here it is, it tells you if you just lay it down in terms of how those factors are related to each other in a graph, you have an answer to all those questions. Some controls are good controls. Some are bad controls. I'll show you some are good controls, okay? If you know Z1 and Z2, you got the answer to your question. If you don't, if you cannot measure them and you can measure coach and fitness level, you are done. If you measure only team motivation and pre-game pro, uh, preoceptions, you are done. These are good control. Here's a bad control. Previous injury gives you trouble, it's a collider. So the theory now gives you an answer to these questions that took a hundred years for scientists to grapple with. I consider that to be a victory. I call it the backdoor victory because the backdoor is the, the criterion for which is a good control and which is a bad control. And I call it victory whenever I find myself able to do things that I couldn't do yesterday, I called it a victory. And <clears throat> the name of the victory is confounding is now Deconfounding. The whole problem of confounding, which started with Carl Pearson in 1998, has now been solved. And if you have this kind of graph, you have a software now that automatically gives you a list of all the good controls. And moreover, 
automatically gives you, if you have fine cost to the measurements, it can find for you the least costly set of good control to condition on, to adjust for. <clears throat> Moreover, it also tells you uh, <clears throat> the degree to which uh, each one of those measurement or adjustment um, is gives you a power in estimation, minimizes the number of samples that you need. Okay, now what if you <clears throat> can't measure those good control? Can you do any better? Yes, if you, you can much me only measure Z1 and Z2, there's a non standard adjustment. <clears throat> that allows you to find answer to your query. Okay? And it is complete. So the wisdom that you draw from that is we have effect identify identifiability, solve problem. It is complete in the sense that if you do not, if you are unable to do what the theory tells you you ought to do, then no one can, can do it for you. No one can do better unless you change the assumption. Okay. And it's testable. What do you mean by testable? That means that <clears throat> I can read from the graph implications that I should find in the data. Whenever, wherever I find a missing link here, for instance, between this variable and this variable, there's a missing link. I know that I should expect to find conditional independence in the data, given the coach, which means if I don't find this conditional independence in the data, my model is wrong. And I should change my assumption to fit, to be make it compatible. Okay? So this is testability, which is something you don't find in uh, alternative uh, formulations. Somebody asked me about alternative approaches I don't believe in approach because what I present to you is the unification of all approaches. Okay. So, but <clears throat> testability is one of the beautiful uh, feature of this particular graphical approach. You can read the testable implication from your knowledge. Good. The same applies to computing counterfactual, and I, I want to give you a, 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 a setup where <clears throat> counterfactual is important. Yeah, essentially, it's the center of uh, consideration. Okay? And this is the question of attribution, to attribute credit or blame to a particular person, Mr. A. Here is a client, he died because he used this drug and I want the manufacturer of the drug to pay compensation for the family of the disease because I claim that he would have been alive had he not taken the drug. So here, what is the difference between this and the previous rank two case is that we are talking about the same person and we are talking about a conflict between what he, <clears throat> what we observe about this individual. We know that he took the drug and he died. And we are asking what if he didn't take the drug? Would he be alive? This is how the court defined, not me, the court of law defined the criterion for assigning credit and blame, or in this case, responsibility or liability for the accused. Decide if, if it is more probable than not that Mr. A would be alive, but for the drug, okay? But for means, I tried to write it in a, in a formula. It's the only formula you're gonna see here because I call it probability of necessity. You see, there is a conflict between what we see here about Mr. About Mr. A. He is dead and he took the drug. And I want to find out what would happen, whether he would be alive had he not taken the drug. I have a clash here 
And this is something you don't find in the case of rank two problem, no clash. That's why we call it counterfactual. But it's extremely important in making personalized decision. See, that we are all instructed by the court, not by me, to think counterfactually. And this is the essence of personalized medicine. This is the essence of uh, finding, uh, I am running out of time. So uh, you will find me rushing through, uh, finding whether, well, here the, the, in, the, in the legal setup is very clear. Okay? But what we can <clears throat> see here that sometimes this probability that we have to estimate, and we can estimate it if we have a combination of data. Sometimes we can get from population data a certain combination of frequencies that behooves us to declare a person guilty. Namely, the probability of necessity is between one and one. Namely, he is guilty, which is really a, a miracle. How can you blame a a person on the basis of data taking on uh, other people, population. It, it so happens because we have a logic of counterfactual and because we have a certain combination of data, combination of data it allows us to reveal individual behavior. And if we go now to uh, the case of COVID and you ask yourself, uh, important question, which patients are in greater need because we have a limited resources. The definition of need is also counterfactual. <clears throat> we are looking for the probability that a patient um, with a certain characteristic will improve if and only if he or she is treated, which means <clears throat> he will be alive if treated, and the same person would be dead if not treated, given its characteristic. So this has a tremendous amount of implication for personalized medicine, any situation specific decisions. Um, I mentioned already personalized medicine, identify customers in business worthy of recommendation or of incentive, a special offer that's in the business domain that's where the new form companies are making their money now. <clears throat> Characterizing voters swayable by a slogan. Okay. This is where dictators make their money. And uh, this is where we have to watch for, not giving this, this technology to the political for the scientists among us before we are extremely watchful for what they are doing. And it's all in the paper, uh, <laughs> the paper that is given to you in the references that I provided in my abstract. Okay, now I want just to mention one more, I'll skip the mediation, but I'll go to a, a, another area which is mentioned in your manifesto. Integrating data from diverse, from diverse sources, extremely important under what condition we can do that. So the general problem is how to combine results from several experiments, of experimental and observational study, each conducted on different population under different set of conditions, so as to, con to construct a valid estimate of effect size in a new population, unmatched by any of those studies. Okay. Also named external validity, selection bias is one of the uh, extremely um, practical obstacle in most, in most um, randomized experiments. The people who allow themselves to agree to be part of the experiments are normally homeless, people who need 
the incentive, the either financial incentive or the hope of being treated by experimental drug. And these are different people are not representative of the people who eventually are going to receive the treatment or receive the policy. So the question is, when can we do it? I demonstrated here uh, in terms of experiments done in various hospitals. I want to find the, the cause and effect in Arkansas. Well, we have had, I have data in New York hospital and I have data from Los Angeles, mainly younger population. In Texas, they are mostly Spanish speaking subject. In San Francisco, they are, or oh, in Boston, they are successful lawyers. And you can see that the condition vary from each hospital to another hospital. That is something that is undoable as, as we talk in English, <clears throat> because the number of variables here is uh, enormous and we don't have the mental capacity of putting them together. But if we, if we reduce it to the mathematics in a form of selection diagram like that, it becomes doable. And here you can find a, a representation of those different populations, those different experiments, different studies done. Each S node tells you what condition is different. In this case, for instance, the W, <coughs> the relationship between X and W differ between Arkansas and where it was taken. So every time you expect to have difference, you mark it in the form of unknown condition S. Now you, you have mathematics and you can put it together. And we have the mathematics and you have software. So that when you plug in those many experiments in this form, you get an answer. What can be fused and how? What does it mean? What can it mean? that experimental results can be fused together if you are able to express the commonalities and differences in the form of a selection diagram like before. And when estimation is feasible, then fusion formula can be derived in polynomial time. What does it mean, the fusion formula? It tells you a recipe. Thou shall take this, <clears throat> this relationship from this experiment this relationship from this experiment, this data from the third experiment, and thou should put it together in a specific way, sum and products and various combination of them, and will tell you what combination is valid in polynomial time, okay? Moreover, it complete, which means no one can do better. And if it cannot be done, then something is wrong with your assumptions, not with your uh, algorithm. Completeness is important, which means that answer to uh, as answer to your uh, desiderata that you cannot do it without the causal technique. You cannot do it by just looking at the distribution that you get from the various uh, studies without expressing them in terms of the causal mechanism that is responsible for the differences and the commonality. I think I'm getting to the end of my, oh, it's already six minutes past one o'clock and I haven't even given you a chance to ask questions. So I'll postpone the question. Oh, I, I'm getting to the last, the last uh, conclusion. I cite again Gary King uh, exp <laughs> con uh, conclusion about the revolution, but I like to confront it with my own <clears throat> my own perception of where the next revolution will take place. The next revolution will be even more impactful. Once we realize that data science is a science of interpreting reality and not of summarizing data. 
So data science is a two-body problem. Reality on one side and data is a reflection of reality, not a reflection of itself. Once we realize that, we can come and we can thank all my co-workers here. And I should also mention here as a citation from De Morgan, who is a contemporary of George Bull, who came out with a very insightful uh, statement here, or quote, every science that has thriven, has thriven upon its own symbols. If you don't have a language to articulate your questions, and a logic, a grammar to manipulate those symbols. You are limited in what you can do. And this applies to many of the satellite uh, fields that look at the explosion in cause and inference and say, oh, we have been doing it all along. Stat statisticians have been doing it all along, and economists did it already in the time of Marshall, and, um, and who else? Social scientists and so on. No, if you did not have the language, the vocabulary, the symbols to express mathematically <clears throat> what you have in mind, your knowledge, your assumptions, and your questions, then you haven't done that. So uh, you have the references in my abstract and I highly recommend the book of why, where I try to express it as best I could in a, to a general public with the least equation as I could. And um, yeah, I hope uh, I've managed to convince you that it would be worth to look into what happened in the causal revolution that you can make, put into use with your work. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Pearl. Uh, we have lots of questions on the chat and question and answer. Will you be? Uh... Yes, I'm here for uh, as, as long as you want me to. Okay, so thank you so much. Uh, let me uh, go over question and answers first. Uh, <clears throat> the first question is, am I wrong in finding many similarities between causal reasoning with logic programming? The works of uh, Kowalski in interpreting horn clauses and later inducting call logic programming. The main dis distinction may be in knowledge representation. I know that there are similarities. I haven't followed them. How do I know? Because I know that people in logic programming uh, make reference to my work and they are uh, publishing papers, still publishing papers in this area and they're getting results. I haven't followed the similarities and difference between the two. Um, I think there are similarities, definitely. I know the work of uh, the people in Austin, Texas, Gelman and Lifshitz. Thank you. Uh, however, Good. if they're not using graph, then they need a different approach. Why? <laughs> because graph has these beautiful properties of, of uh, testability and transparency which I, I hope I convince you. Transparency means that you can, you can look at your assumption and find out, have I missed any? 
do they imply another impi assumption? Can I get, uh, and uh, that's one, uh, yeah, that's correct. Are they redundant? All this question, you just look at the graph and you find out if they are redundant, if they if you, if you forgot any, okay? And testability, that's something that I haven't found in any approaches, including the, uh, the potential outcome or other approaches that you find in the literature, testability. You look at the graph and you find whether you are compatible with the data within polynomial time in technical term, within the ability of each researchers to, to, do, to do that unaided. So ne uh, thank you, Professor Pearl. Uh, next one is, could Professor Pearl direct us to any reference as to why Granger cause, uh, causality is purely associational? Oh, I can refer you to, well, first of all, it's very easy. It's very easy for everyone to convince him or herself that it is purely associational. You look at the definition and you find probabilities, done. If it is expressible in terms of probabilities, you are done. You don't have to uh, be a philosopher of science or rocket scientist to tell, to convince yourself that it is not causal. Another convincing argument I can give you that in 1991, I happened to have a dinner with Granger, with Clive Granger in Uppsala, Sweden. And when we were drinking the second glass of wine, he confessed to me that he feels uncomfortable with people calling Granger causality, causality, as he understand that it has nothing to do with causality. Okay. But since the, the term, um, he, the term Granger causality became so entrenched in the literature, he doesn't know how to uh, t take it out of the literature. So he leaves it there, but he qualifies and say, it has nothing to do with causality. It has to do with time sequence uh, of um, correlation. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> the next one is, uh, how would you compare and contrast structural causal models and structural equation models, SEM as known in psychological methodology? Yeah, beautiful, beautiful question. Beautiful question, yeah. <clears throat> A structural causal model, okay, the name that I coined to make it very clear that we are talking about structure and not about, and not about everything that flowed into the literature of, S, of uh, structural, sorry, uh, but well, I'm sorry, what was the other one? Uh, uh, the structural equation model and structural causal. Well, yeah, structural equation model was really path diagram invented by civil right as we saw it. Okay. It was neglected for a long time, rediscovered by social scientists like. Um, uh, I forgot the name, okay, and economists, okay, and in the 1960s, and by, uh, I should say, Herbert Simon too, and they uh, used it, you know, to find cause-effect relationship on the basis of causal assumptions, okay. But they didn't know the gold mine upon, uh, upon which they are sitting. It was limited to linear equations. It was uh, eventually with the in invention of Lisserl, 
in Israel, it became a piece of software that uh, scientists would just uh, put down a model, submit it to a software and get an answer whether you have a certain, whether it is compatible. And if it is compatible, uh, how strongly compatible it is, and that's it. Even the question answer that were not causal. So it was, I would say, hijacked by statistician to the points where when Friedman asked the uh, gurus of structural equation model, uh, modeling, what is the philosophy of your um, <clears throat> method? And they came back to him with um, answers such as, we better not, we better refrain from using cause effect relationship when we talked about our models. We better eliminate all references to causation when we talked about structural equation models, okay? Uh, which means they have, they didn't even consider their tools to be tools of causation. And so why would you put it in the form of equations and not in the form of, but in, in a graph of equations? And because it's more understandable. It, but what was the question? That was the answer. But um, so the, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the answer is <laughs> that the advocates and the users of structural equation models did not see themselves as uh, dealing with, co with causal questions. You rarely find the question, for instance, what is the effect of doing X or Y or Z, or what is the effect of a policy? Definitely not counterfactual. They, they thought they are doing statistics. Um, <clears throat> thank you. So the next question is uh, Professor Pearl. Yes. Uh, causality is based on causal assumptions. If the causal assumption is wrong, then the causal conclusion is not valid. Among all the possible words of causal assumption, it is challenging to find the right assumption. Do you have any suggestions about how to tackle this almost impossible challenge? Beautiful question. I always get it. What if you don't have the assumptions? Okay. I have... <clears throat> Or what if you have the wrong model? Or what if you don't have the model? Or what if you don't feel comfortable in the model that you have? My first answer to that is give up. Because it's a mathematical proof that if you don't have any assumptions, you cannot get the answer to your question, which means the answer is gonna be ambiguous. One refuge from the, one remedy to that is you do sensitivity analysis. You say, how sensitive is my answer to the, this assumption or that assumption? So I <clears throat> would like to find, um, but what will be the measure? Suppose you find out that it is very sensitive to this assumption and not so sensitive to that assumption. So what? It's all based on how plausible is your assumption. And this is in, in, so you can do sensitivity analysis, but it's still sensitivity doesn't relieve you from the um, dependence on the notion of plausibility. But it answers some question. And by the way, the, um, 
determination that smoking causes cancer by the Sur Surgeon General of the United States was given on the basis of sensitivity analysis. It would be implausible to assume that the differences we see between the correlation would be uh, feasible to, to be could be attributed to difference in genetic making. Okay, because of implausible implausibility, mm, the Surgeon General came up to the conclusion and uh, official determination that is a causal relationship. So it's again. Second, <clears throat> if you don't have the model, study the model, try to find it okay, with the various techniques which are available today in terms of uh, under the rubric causal discovery. Okay, but you have to study the properties of um, a model in order to be able to find one. Okay. I give the analogy of it's very hard to find a needle in a haystack, but it's doubly hard if you haven't seen a needle before. Okay. So you have to see a needle before, namely a causal model to know what you're looking for. Third one, you do have a lot of knowledge. Sometimes the knowledge that you require, the causal knowledge, is a very rudimentary and uh, I would say common knowledge. For instance, that the uh, uh, taking a drug doesn't change the sex of the patient. This is causal knowledge, but sometimes rudimentary relationship of that sort are sufficient to give us enough to, to, pro, to, pro, to uh, enable the tools and getting the conclusion that we want. And by the way, this simple relationship that treatment doesn't change the sex of the um, subject has been a stumbling block in the Simpson paradox. Okay? And, and the people could not, could not articulate that the simple relationship okay, in terms of conditional probabilities, because there is a correlation between the two, between the patient sex and the uh, taking or the selection of a treatment. So people could not even articulate this simple assumption that treatment does not change the sex of the uh, of the patient. So sometimes you can get by with very common, very agreeable, on which we have full consensus. Sometimes you don't have the knowledge and you have to resort to um, causal discovery method, which I should, I did not mention here, but I say people discover all kind of asymmetries which are not obvious and they can put them into use. Asymmetries, I mean, in the relationship between the um, X and Y that you can take advantage on and go and turn the crank and find a set of models <clears throat> which is compatible with your data. And sometimes you can give the set parsimonious description so you, you wouldn't need to enumerate each member of the set, but you can treat the set as one object and do inference on the set of possible models and get answer to the query. What does it mean to get an answer? You get an answer which is common to every member of the set. So you don't need to distinguish with them. They all agree on the answer. Thank you. <clears throat> and the next well, question. I, I, I want to say oh, one more thing. Okay. And this is explainability. Don't forget that no matter what you do, eventually you have to give an answer to a human being, to a researcher. And the researcher has to trust the answer that the machine 
or the algorithm provides. And this answer has to be given in a form which the researchers will say, yes, this makes sense. I trust it. And this is only one answer is in the form of a causal explanation. So even if you're trying to avoid causal explanation at all costs, and you go to machine learning, and you go to a, a neural nets, eventually you are stuck. You have to provide the answer to a human user. And there's only one answer that the user will trust eventually. And <coughs> you build up a trustable relationship between machine and human. And this is causal diagram. Go ahead. Thank you. <clears throat> so uh, the next one is uh, a question that has plagued me since uh, my first lesson in causal inference is sex manipulable? No, sex, of course, is not manipulated, but it doesn't, it doesn't forbid us from asking the hypothetical question about what if the sex of this candidate would have been different? Would I hire him? You see, counterfactual doesn't require that you can mechanically or physically change the um, hypothetical variable. And it's not me that have come with it. Look at the court definition. The court de definition of discrimination using the counterfactual. Head, did I show it to you? So let me go there and show you. It's a core definition. Here it is. Mm. No, 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 no. Uh, wait a second. Yeah. Here. This is how the court defines what constitutes discrimination. Oh, I, I lost my mouse one second one more second i i found it i found it here it is here it is it's it's a 1996 gold court decision the central question in any employment discrimination case is whether the employer would have taken the same action had the employee been of different race, age, sex, religion, national origin, etc., and everything else had been the same. Okay. You see, you have here nested counterfactual in the court definition of what constitutes discrimination. It's not my invention. So the court says, had the employees been of different race. You cannot manipulate race physically, but you can imagine that. And what, is, what does the court mean by had the sex been different? How can you imagine had the sex been different? Okay. And, and how is it possible that we form a consensus on questions such as had Oswald not killed Kennedy? We know he did. And we form a consensus, right? We can, can talk about it. Or even <clears throat> as long as the Thucydides, the Greek historian, when said, had there been no, um, no earthquake, this, this tsunami would not have taken place. What does it mean? It means that we share a scientific knowledge in the form of a causal model. Once we have the causal model, we can figure out the answer to all kinds of factors. And therefore, we form a consensus. That is the reason that we communicate and we quickly agree or disagree on any counterfactual term. Or we can discuss it at least, whether it is true that Kennedy would be alive today had Oswald not killed him. Okay. We can discuss it and we understand each other. Why? 
because we share common knowledge about the causal relationship in the world. And that sharing gives us the ability to form a consensus about what? About every counterfactual, even though it's not manipulable. So yes, I can ask the question, had the sex of this employee been different, would I have hired him? Or would the employee have hired him? I can even compute it if I have a causal model. And if I don't have a computer model, I have a, I have a, a logic of counterfactual coming out from this definition. A logic of counterfactual allows you to come up with a conclusion even if you don't have the model. Give you a bound on maybe on the counterfactual. So, but never hesitate from saying, had <clears throat> had he not uh, had he not been obese, even though I cannot manipulate the obesity. And then we had a big discussion on that uh, controversy, whether it is the obesity that causes. Uh, um, uh, uh, health problem or it is the soda. You can talk about the obesity being responsible for the health cause without referring to the soda, even though your manipulation is the amount of sugar taken, that how you may, or the amount of exercise you do or lifestyle, okay, that you can talk about the obesity because that is the variable which exists in your model of the world. This is something which is invariant. Lifestyle vary from Africa to Asia. The effect of obesity on cost is a property of human biology that remains invariant and so on, I can go on. My message is do not hesitate to attribute counterfactuals to uh, variables which are not manipulable. The court has done it and lawyers understand each other, right? So I have, you have the freedom as a scientist. And eventually lawyers will accept our definition of counterfactual. So uh, we have a, a lot of questions uh, online. Uh, should we, and I'm not sure whether everybody who wrote the question might be here. Uh, should I uh, do like uh, ask them to raise their hands and uh, do it interactive? With fine, fine. fine, if I don't understand it, you translate. Okay, sure. So, uh, so uh, all please uh, raise your hand uh, if uh, you have questions and I will go through them one by one and you will be online, you will be speaking yourself. And if uh, I need to uh, repeat the question, I will be happy to do that. Werner? Werner? Okay. Uh, uh, you need to unmute yourself. Myself, me? Oh, well, no. Well, no, yeah. Uh, looks like he's not there. Let's uh, go to the next one. Tomiki, uh, sorry, did I pronounce your name? Yes, it's Tomiko. Okay. Tomiko. Thank you, Dr. Singh. And thank you, Dr. Pearl, for this very important and useful talk and for generously sharing your time with us. Um, I'd just like to ask you a more general question as to what you feel are the most important issues currently today that causal inference could and should be applied to. 
and thank you again. It varies from uh, with the background of the researcher. Uh, I assume that most of you are practical researchers. You want to find answer to um, <clears throat> questions of uh, treatments. I, I don't really know uh, what kind of questions you consider to be practical. For me today, the key questions is um, of the interesting and exciting question is uh, personalized medicine. Okay. There is a difference between um, <clears throat> behavior of individual, um, I'm sorry, behavior of population and what we know about individual. And we have here today the tools to personal, to really personalize uh, decision-making, which means to talk about how an individual will react to a treatment, whether or not, uh, the individual will be benefit or be hurt or harmed by the uh, treatment considered. And we can get all the, this information from population data. So this going from population to individual is a, is a mind boggling ability that the logic provides us. And I think it's gonna revolutionize, revolutionize personalized medicine to the point where we can decide this particular patient has a higher priority than this patient. Therefore, he needs the bed in the, <clears throat> in the hospital. It's more, more um, it, it's, um, it's a higher priority on, a, on both on societal cost consideration and individual consideration. So I think we are opening with a great possibility here. Another one for me personally is the question of uh, um, social intelligence. What does it mean to, how do we build a trust between um, a machine and a user to the degree that we can communicate with a machine with um, the same kind of vocabulary that we treat each other. Namely, I tell you, trust me, I know how you feel. I, I, I would feel the same way if I were you. Or oh, haven't I told you? Are you aware of the fact that I have told you that before? Are you aware of the fact that um, <clears throat> You don't have the you don't have the ability, or you don't have the the mental capacity to figure out so and so. This is how you and I communicate. Don't aren't you aware of the fact that we need known knowledge to solve this problem? You and I communicate that way in social relationship, and my personal um, excitement today is to find out how to equip machine with such ability so that machine among themselves will be able to communicate on the social level. Assign emotion, responsibilities, regret, compassion, and basic, basically trust. But that's, that's personal. Because I consider our ability today to emulate understanding on a machine to be an invaluable tool. To be able to, to have a, a, an emulator of ourselves, it means to build understanding of how we reason about whatever we do. And for me, this is a, a, an invaluable tool. We are going to solve some of the basic cognitive puzzles 
that is part of philosophy of science and um, cognitive researchers from, for, for centuries, like free will, for instance. We are going to solve it because we have a, an emulator of ourselves. Thank you, Dr. Pearl. Thank you. Um, David, you are next. David? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, my apologies. Um, certainly I've, I've read a number of times um, your most recent book. My, my question for you is, who else do you believe is doing the most interesting and exciting research in, in causal um, research today? And basically who else should we be listening to, following, reading about? I should first uh, point you to my former students, okay? uh, Elias Birnbaum, Elias, uh, Elias Spitzer, uh, Kartika. These are the, I mean, people that I know have been doing some of the milestone works. Jin Tian, okay, they come to mind. I, I mentioned them at the last thing. <clears throat> Especially, I think Elias Bauenboim. He is having. A, he has done a lot of uh, both theoretical and uh, practical computational work, and he has a computational platform, and he and he understands what other people are doing. Other than my former students. I would, I, I would like to say that I'm happy to see so many new players in the field that I cannot even keep track of who they are and I cannot name them. But if you look at the number of uh, speakers at the new conferences and workshops all around, um, you can pin them down and the, the key criterion if they understand the, the ladder of causation. This is the key, in my opinion, between those who understand causal reasoning and those who are just getting into it. So look for the ladder of causation, look for the vocabulary in which they express the three level of the hierarchy, counterfactual, actions, the do operator, and the associational. This is the key. Those who do not distinguish between the three layers and they're meddling around with causal inference and they're claiming they're doing causal inference and I can name in many people of that nature, okay? I do not, I, I haven't learned anything from them. And therefore I say, I, I cannot recommend their work. The key is to understand the three level of understanding, the three level of the causal hierarchy. And you can tell it right away in the notation they are using. They cannot hide it. Thank you. Chiang, uh, do you want to ask? Oh, thank you, Dr. Pro, for the wonderful presentation. I have a quick question. Uh, thinking about the, the recent advances of uh, neural networks, uh, learning first the principal laws in PDE-based uh, physical systems, like uh, as far as I know, through something like a uh, symbolic regression or the learning for the variational functionals, something like that. Uh, do you think that in the future, the, uh, the current model assisted uh, causal reasoning can finally achieve a level of something like a, a model free level, mm, something like in my mind, something like a learning the causal structures by machine itself. Is that a possible or do you think that it's a, it is a, it is not possible. Thank you. 
It's possible and it, uh, it collects a lot of uh, momentum recently, the possibility of uh, the whole causal discovery. Yeah. And there are many tricks. And uh, I may perhaps I should mention a few. But you have to have, you have to know what you are looking for when you're looking for it. And that's why you have to study the properties of man-made causal model before you can expect to discover it automatically by machine. So in terms of education, you must teach the properties first of man-made causal models. Now, there is a, um, a work done currently in the machine in learning areas, which is called the uh, representation learning, which has uh, is based on the following principle. If I change environment and I take uh, um, and I and I do prediction in various environment, I essentially do a prediction under various conditions. And changing conditions amount to changing. It's the same thing as making a manipulation, like taking action. So it's, it's very close to making an experiment, changing environment. Therefore, let me do, let me exercise and learn my neural net on many environments and see what's common among them, what remains invariant. Yes. And from that, figure out what my, the causal model ought to be to account for those invariances. So this is a new developing area now, which is on the border between uh, deep learning and um, causal inference. But again, I don't think you can make much progress though until you find out what the properties are of the thing you are looking for. You are looking for the set of environment. You have to understand how to represent that model once you discover it and represent it in such a way that you can answer questions using it, not just represent it by saying, this is my model. So you need to study causal inference to begin with. And you also, you have to know the limitation of your method. What should the work, or the, what should be this collection of many environments be like before your algorithms will discover the commonality? Again, you have to reason from the hypothesis to the evidence, from the model to the data. Thank you, Professor. And um, Brian. Uh, hi, hi, Professor Brawl. I want to say it's a pleasure. I've, I've read your work for so long. It's a pleasure to get to interact with you finally. Um, I wanted to ask a sort of practical question. Um, so you've talked about software. Um, I'm curious about sources of information on, in particular, um, tutorials and software that provide a unified perspective, right? What you often, what I've found getting into causal inference is that while the, you know, the high level mathematics is, is unified, tutorials and software are often not. Um, so it's hard to find a good source to deal with simultaneously things like measurement error and selection and missing data. Um, so can you recommend, you know, good sources of software and good tutorials that cover those kind of topics? I know that uh, Elias Barenboim has a lot of software available for free. And I think you should uh, refer to him because uh, he offers his platforms to uh, the community. Tutorial, he also gives tutorials, but it's not uh, maybe not what we are looking for. Um, well, I'm trying to give tutorials of that nature I don't know of how, <clears throat> how satisfactory they are. Uh, now, what, what are you looking for in a tutorial? 
comparison between the various techniques, between various um, paradigms or frameworks? Yeah, what, what I run into a lot is um, linking, you know, my causal diagram to an estimation software that can handle mm. the complexity of my question. I tend to have um, simultaneous issues with measurement error and clustered variables like, you know, multiple observations from people. And the Bayesian software that is sort of unified is often not capable of sort of estimating data at the scale that I possess. Oh, there's a good paper uh, by people from DeepMind company, which uh, incorporate all these uh, questions that you have. I think they have a selection bias, missing data, all incorporated in their software. But I, I cannot name now the authors. <clears throat> but whenever I get them, I tweet them. So join my Twitter account. I said, oh, I'm very excited about this paper. I tweet it, then I forget my, the name of the author. I'm sorry, but it's there on my Twitter account. So you can always retweet it. Yeah, thank you. Dana? Hi. Um... Yeah, I have a similar uh, question to the previous one. Um, I'm finishing the book of why, and uh, I, I write, uh, I'm, I'm sort of a mid-level beginner on machine le learning software and neural networks. And I'd like to uh, uh, know the next um, place to go that's, that is more technical to help me get started on actually implementing uh, your methods in my models. Yeah, the next thing after the book of why is this book. <clears throat> yeah, causal inference in statistics. It's um, it's not as technical as my book causality, and uh, it's written for for people who are just getting into that area, for statisticians mainly. You can see. And yeah. so I, I would recommend that. It's available essentially for free on my, uh, if you look up my website. Very good, I will do that, thank you. And then you can go to the uh, book of causality, which is more technical. Okay. Now, are, are those both up to date with, uh, with, your, with your work? The book this of causality? Is, yeah. Okay, very good. It, it, it doesn't have uh, missing data and it doesn't have it doesn't have the personalized decision making but well, it has some yeah well, that's perfect thank you and it doesn't have a transportability work sorry okay so the okay. vision I guess I could read a few papers, but like 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 the last uh, question said, uh, I want to get the full framework, you know, and um, and uh, those things will be uh, important. Thank you. And, and Ling Yu Zhen. Uh, hi. Um, uh, could you hear me? I can hear. You, yes. Sorry, uh, yes. Okay, yeah. Um, uh, my question is how, uh, how would you address a research problem where uh, you cannot draw your graph uh, incomplete or maybe your graph model have some mistakes that you don't know? Um, how would you address the problem there? Well, <clears throat> how do you address the problem when you have uh, three equations and four variables? You have only three equations and you have four variables and you look at them and say, I cannot answer the question. I don't have enough information. Why is it so hard to 
to, to uh, accept the fact that sometimes we don't have the information to answer the question that we want answered. So what do we do when we have four variables and three equations? We make assumptions about a, a third equation that perhaps constrain them, okay? We do we give up, which is not too bad. You know how many man hours were saved by the uh, rules? I think it was in, uh, when, where was it? It's about the, the eight, beginning of the 18th century where they, did, they discover that you could, that you need X, N equation for N variables. How many man hours were saved by the realization that we cannot answer a certain question? Therefore, we have to supplement them with additional knowledge. This is exactly the case here. Now, I haven't finished here. If you <clears throat> still believe that, the, that there should be an answer, but you don't have the right information, then the system itself can recommend to you certain um, new variables that you perhaps can measure or new errors you can add to diagram or certain errors you can take out of the diagram. First of all, it's very easy to represent in a diagram a state of complete ignorance. And this is where everybody is connected to everybody else, okay? The assumptions are the missing errors. Does have both statistical implication and causal implication. So if everything is connected to everything else, I don't know anything else. But the system can ask you, is it possible that we can <clears throat> dispose of this arrow and assume it doesn't exist? or it's very small, or it's insignificant. If not, then perhaps we can measure a certain variable lying right there between X and Z. If you can measure it, then you can get an answer to your question. Or the system can recommend experiments. And if you can only conduct this experiment, vary the, this and see what happened to that then you will be able to answer your question. And this is what we mean by an automated scientist. Okay. To figure out what experiments are relevant or the most critical one, where to control and pay attention to. This is the automated scientific exploration part, which I said is blue skies, but the system that's available today have all the capability of leading you toward those questions. So I don't know if I answered you. I know that you expect a miracle. The system gives you the answer, no miracle. If you don't have a certain information, no one can answer this question, provable. Two equations with three unknowns, impossible. But what has been impossible? It means you have multiple answers. All of them are in compliance with your equations. All of them comply with your assumption with whatever you gave me, but it doesn't answer your question, I understand. In the case of causality, we have this um, prior belief that there should be an answer and for good reason because we see organisms that get the answer. We see children in the crib learning with very few samples, see, and we see them um, getting the correct answer. They know exactly why tinkering with this toy would make noise and thinking with that toy would not make noise. They understand it, okay? So we, we have organisms called children that do reach an answer. So we assume that we should have the answer too. If we do only neural nets with certain tricks, the answer is no. Neural nets with tricks will not get you to where children, to the level of children, because children are born with the innate template 
of a causal network that they don't have because it's domain dependent, but they strive to get. So you have to build into your machine the um, desire to fill in the blank until they get the, the causal network that they seek so uh, anxiously. So this is, I think the reason why people are surprised that we cannot get an answer. They're not surprised when you cannot figure out three variables with two, I'm sorry, <laughs> with a, <laughs> two equations with three variables. They're not surprised that you cannot get an answer, but they're surprised that the machine cannot learn <clears throat> what the effect is of a certain treatment. Because Thank you so human much. Beings yeah. Do. yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Kerr. Yeah. Uh, Lingu Zen. Uh, uh, that was oh, me. Lingu. Yeah, sorry, that was me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, oh, sorry. Lingu Zen. Is that you already did? Is that right? Uh, uh, yeah, you, uh, you just call me twice. Sorry. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, so let me take uh, one question because uh, uh, that user is not able to unmute. This is from NS Niki Su. So I worked with Professor Kelvin Normore at UCLA and I am currently very interested in how we can improve current general education by teaching younger age students the practical use of causal inference through how we can apply basic inference rules in logic and show how various fields use them. I have noticed that when scientists have a hypothesis of A requires B, they take B away to see if a no longer is observed. This seems like an application of the con uh, contrapositive rule in basic logic. Is this an example of what you mean by manipulability and intervention in the ladder of causation? Are you in the department of mathematics? Uh, it's I'm trying to find I the don't think uh, there is any uh, mention of that. Uh, what are you? I, so I understand you are teaching logic. No, she is not. Uh, she, uh, Nikki Su is not in Department of Mathematics. So I, I need to have your background. <clears throat> yeah, you cannot express <clears throat> causal relationship using classical logic. Okay. It's obvious because the, the contrapositive is violated uh, just, I, the best thing is to show that you cannot do that is try to get a simple example like I give in the first chapter on the, of the book of why <clears throat> of a firing squad but the logical relationship are very clear okay the prisoner is dead if any one of the uh, firing, if the rifleman is shooting, the rifleman will not shoot unless the captain gives an order. It's a very clear uh, causal relationship. But you express it in logic and you find you cannot answer a simple question like what will happen if fireman A decides to shoot despite not having a signal from the captain? Okay. Or would the rifleman B still shoot if rifleman A, A decide not to shoot? Things like that, which are causal relationship, cannot be answered in the framework of classical logic because it doesn't capture the causal relationship. These are different relationships than material implication. Material implication in logic does not capture the causal relationship <clears throat> if A then B. 
So what can I tell you? Which there are logic which do approach the causal level. And this is um, temporal logic. Some of the temporal logic do that. And some, um, I can't even name them. Okay. Model logic, many of the model logic do approach the causal or do we are interested and they answer some of the questions that causal language does. Okay. But you have to make sure you have the right model logic to do that. And you have to express yourself not in model logic because no one will understand if you and your problem and you will not be able to understand your assumptions a day after you put them on paper. You yourself will not be able to recall your own assumptions. And if you agree with them, if you have missed anyone, if you don't use transparent methods like causal diagram, or at least equations. So going to causal model or to a, a model logic is good for logician, it's good for some philosophers, but it's not good to develop trust between men and machine. Thank you. <clears throat> she says, thank you. Oh. Uh, Tomiko. Hi, um, I was asked to unmute. Um, my name is Sarah. Um, thank you so much for the talk, Dr. Pearl, and for Dr. Singh for um, hosting and for staying after to answer our questions. I just had a quick, this is kind of like a sort of non-technical question, but I still think it could be pretty important. And I'm curious to know, like, what do you think about like the ethical concerns and considerations when it comes to making predictions based on population data on individual behavior? And I'm thinking about this particularly in a context of the criminal justice system, um, where algorithms have been used to predict whether someone would, you know, escape bail. And, you know, there have been uh, concerns about that in terms of inequity. So I'm curious to know what you think of that. Thank you. Uh, you're asking, I think, two questions. You're asking whether the predictions made this way would be reliable. And then you're asking whether it is ethical, which are two different questions. I, which one would you like me to address? I would like to address the ethical part of that question. Yeah, it's a Difficult question. Everybody today is worried about machine taking over, making decisions that normally have been taken by human beings. <clears throat> and especially with the danger that machine will be able to excel and do it much quicker than us, perhaps even take over and um, and multiply themselves and um, <clears throat> so the, the ethical question we have to be watchful because there's a real danger the machine will we will duplicate themselves and breed new species of intelligent machine much superior to us and control our life essentially may make us into pets or make us, make us into slaves to serve them. And they will fight among each other like we do fight today among each other. Okay. So this is all science fiction, which is relevant today because uh, we are in real danger of machine taking over, starting with military um, application and ending up with deciding on whether you are you get a loan or don't get a loan <clears throat> however i always resort to the um, analogy of us bringing up our children we bring the children under great danger they will be smarter than us not only they will be smarter there is a danger they will be 
much more wicked than us. They, they will recognize their power over us and take over, take over the family, the family possession, the country, and become Genghis Khan or whoever. It's always a danger. But we still bring up our children. We give them the best education with the hope that they will acquire our value system. And most of the time, we succeed. Once in a time, we don't succeed. And your child becomes a Putin. So, but we take a risk. And that is exactly the risk we have to take when we are now bringing up a new species of organism that like computer that have the chance of, of taking over. But will they take over or will they be just a very helpful apprentice to us? It's a difficult question. We have to be watchful, but we have to find hope in the fact that we do bring children and we do educate children with our value system. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, the next one is uh, Marcia. Thank you, Professor Singh and Professor Perl. And thank you for staying this late to answer all these questions. <laughs> um, I have a question regarding the causal graphs. Um, yeah. So uh, why causal graphs are only studied uh, as directed acyclic graphs? There are some research done by uh, Sprite from Carnegie Mellon and Thomas Richardson from University of Washington with cyclic graphs, uh, with only a couple of papers of that. Uh, but moreover in nature, biological science, climate models, I think management also in, in the public policy arena, feedback processes, in the form of cyclic systems are more pervasive, right? So the question is why most causal inferences related to, to DAX uh, with no cycles? Um, and I think, well, uh, as you previously said, um, previous we had this causal of phobia, right? Uh, but yeah. I, think, I think we need, uh, we need to overcome this cyclic, cyclic phobia from econometrics or something like that. What, what, is, what are your thoughts about this? <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, let me get some causal graph here. Okay, good. <clears throat> Number one, SCM, structural causal models, are not limited to DAG, to directed acyclic graph. They are defined for any collection of equations, including feedback. And I can define counterfactual for this collection of equations. And I have it in, my, in the book, Causality, you can find at least two examples of, uh, of cyclic graph that answer counterfactual questions and a, a method of doing it. So, so when we're talking about the equations that decorate those arrows, if you look at that as a collection of equations, okay, injury is, is an is equation. Um, injury is related by equation, is a function of this and that. And that is a function of that. That's the function. You have a collection of functions, it's fine. If we know those functions, that it, it, it can be cyclic as well. It turns out that to get the beauty of backdoor, which is another, we need the disseparation. Disseparation tells you what you can expect in the data, given that you have a missing link in the model. <clears throat> That's a very powerful tool to give us the beauty and the working holes called backdoor victory which solve the problem of confounding and so on, okay? 
this cannot be done without the disseparation, and this separation works for cyclic model, but only for linear. And spirit has proved this. And it doesn't work for nonlinear. Recently, I saw a beautiful uh, um, dissertation in the University of Amsterdam. I've been on the committee there, of, and a beautiful paper which generalizes the work of spiritus to uh, many, in many cases, both from selection bias and um, confounding and, uh, and, and to, you know, to cyclic graph. So it is a problem area which is being worked on and there is momentum in the field and there is a need to generalize it. And indeed it will be generalized. I don't think the economists will do it because they don't, economists do not understand the three level of the ladder. But eventually causal inference people will accomplish this. And then we'll have, we know at least how far we can go with cyclic uh, graph or the cyclic system of equations. Thank you, Professor, and, and please keep the good work and the dissemination of knowledge that you're doing in Twitter, on Twitter. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. And so next question is uh, from Boli. He could not uh, uh, unmute. Uh, and so I'm reading the question. For the task of image recognition, in machine learning, how can we frame the question in terms of causality? Can we say that individual pixels or perhaps higher level features such as a head or a hand are the causes of the image being some subject, some object, for example, a cow? The only available data in this example task that is pictures are in the same time frame, so nothing can cause anything else to the problem is ill posed uh, in the first place. Right. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> in the case of image recognition, most of the work done was the classification. To distinguish a tiger from a, from a pussycat, Okay, um, classification is a different problem altogether. It's in the level of association, in the lower levels. So it doesn't, theoretically, it doesn't apply there. Plus, the question that you raised, which is ob object properties relationship, it's a different kind of relationship. It doesn't fall into the cause effect relationship. So we need a new calculus, we have to incorporate that in, together with the calculus of object property, which belongs to a subset of the predicate calculus. Everything I've done here is in a propositional calculus. It needs to be augmented to go to predicate calculus. Yes, I agree with you, but it's a totally different question. What you can learn from causal analysis is two things. Number one, when you go to a higher level of scene analysis, like uh, a guy is waiting for the elevator, you know that you expect the elevator to be open and somebody to come up, or you expect him to press the button. When you go to scene analysis, then causal relationship play a role. That's question number one. Not to <clears throat> not too static, but to uh, Seen, scenes domain. And the second one, what we have discovered in our <clears throat> causal corner, a small corner of the general AI enterprise, small corner, but you can still learn from it that by playing around with toy problems, you get to distinguish the theoretical impediment from the technical difficulties. And this is a lesson that I hope will be borrowed by people 
working in scene analysis and in other area like the natural language understanding. Okay? Think, think around with toy problems to learn and distinguish. So that whose answer you know ahead of time and see what makes the solution doable from non-doable. This is a lesson that I would like to bring to display here and I hope people will learn from that. There is a follow-up question from Bo. If there is a time, uh, I, I mean, if there is a time, she's uh, it's asking if uh, you can answer this question as well. I struggle to understand the difference between Neyman and Rubin's potential outcome framework differ from causal diagram. Will, will the two methods give me different results? No. Okay. No, that's good. They are logically equivalent. What does it mean? I'm glad you asked this question. I'm, I'm sure. Why do I, why I'm, I'm happy that you ask it? Because the number of Rubin disciples among our audience is probably 10 times greater than the number of causal inference people in, from, in my disciples, okay? <clears throat> okay, and they all ask the same question. I've been educated on the Neiman Rubin uh, model I feel very comfortable. Should I change my paradigm? Should I change my framework? Is it worth it? What do I gain by this? Here is the answer. Look at this diagram and give me an answer. Imagine that you need to use the Rubin framework to answer the question of which set of variables is a good good to control and to distinguish from a set of variables which are bad control. I can tell you that none of the Rubin disciples that I met, and I met dozens and dozens of them, can answer this question. Why? Why? For, two, for several reasons. They cannot even put the question, articulate it. How? Because they start every problem with assumptions in the form of ignorability condition. This is their starting point. What is ignorability? Ignorability condition. Ignorability tells you that one counterfactual is independent of another counterfactual if you have a certain condition, if you know X. Can you articulate this question in such a horrific, metaphysical, inhuman language as relationship between counterfactuals? Well, some disciples tell me, I can do it. I feel very comfortable to tell you that um, Z1, counterfactual on Z3, is independent on Z2 counterfactual on coach, given another counterfactual. I can see it. Wrong, they cannot see it. They cannot do any toy problem that I give them. They evade the question. They cannot simply do it. However, if you start with such a collection of counterfactuals, you can get the answer. It's like starting at the answer and getting the answer. Because once I get it in the form of conditional independence and non counterfactual, I essentially solve the problem. What I offer you is to articulate the question in the way you talk with your mother. You can talk to you and she will understand you. Yes, if I look at um, a previous injury, it depends on whether it is a contact sport or not. It also depends on the team motivation and aggression. Surely, previous injury depends on this too. She understands it, you understand it, because you are talking in terms of elementary elementary and basic relationship of science. Previous injury listens to the type of sport, listens to, 
variable, one variable listens to the other one. The deflection of the barometer listens to the atmospheric pressure. So when you're talking about variables listening to each other, people understand each other. You understand yourself. You can find out if you missed one assumption, if one assumption dictate another, and all this question. You cannot do it with the language of ignorability and don't fool yourself. If you are a disciple of, of living, all you can solve is simple problems where you know the answer ahead of time, but you cannot solve it in the language that you can you communicate. And another thing is you cannot find the question, you cannot find testability. Here I give you a question you should ask your advisor or your professor. Seriously, if I give you a collection of ignorability conditions, can you infer and tell me if another ignorability condition is implied by them? Can you? Or can you tell me if certain um, <clears throat> Conditional independence in the data is implied by a collection of ignorability conditions. There isn't a logic for that yet. I propose one, but uh, that's for, for my disciples, not for Ruben. Uh, <clears throat> so you, you ask yourself this question. Am I going to invest my career in a language like that? I'm asking it hypothetically, because I know the among of Ruben disciples, <laughs> I can repeat it, among the audience today here is 12 times greater the amount of people who understand graphs. But take, do some soul searching and answer these two questions. Am I happy with the assumptions? Do I, do I have a language to express what I know, which is clear to me, not to others, to, to me, to yourself? And second one, can I test my assumption? It's a hard question. I have been asking this question for Dan Rubin from exactly 1993, when he invited me to Harvard. And I asked him these questions and he still evades those questions until today. It, he tells me that I can do it. My students can do it. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, the next, uh, and uh, I think uh, only three people are there. So uh, I will stop after that. This has been quite a long time. For Professor Pearl to be online. Uh, so uh, this is uh, we. Oh, I know you. Oh, uh, but okay. That was uh, worth waiting, it looks like. Hi, this is Uwe from, from UMIT, Austria. Thank you, Judea. Hi. Uh, we met a few weeks ago. Nice seeing you again. As you know, I'm a decision scientist, so we're interested in the consequences of doing A versus doing B. And in some disciplines, as in medicine and epidemiology, and also more and more now in health technology assessment, which informs clinical guidelines and reimbursements of drugs, we are off benchmarking observational studies with experiments, so randomized clinical trials as, as the gold standard. And, and as you know, one reason popular idea is that observational data can emu emulate such a clinical trial. So my, my question is when we analyze observational mm. data causal correctly, I mean- I don't know of any observational studies that can emulate unless, unless they are enforced with causal assumptions. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's what I'm, I'm saying. So uh, let's say correctly, I mean, based on causal graphs and, and the rules you have developed and sophisticated causal analytical models uh, with G methods developed by Jamie Robbins and his colleagues. The, the question is, is the idea of emulating an experiment a necessary approach and, and, and why or why not? Uh, why do you need to emulate an experiment when you can get an answer directly? 
<clears throat> if you have a causal graph and you, and you agree that you cannot do anything with observational studies unless they are augmented or enriched with causal assumptions, essentially with the graph, right? So given a <clears throat> observational studies and a causal graph associated with that study, you can answer the question that you ask. What will be the effect of my action? Why do I need to get and emulate a, 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 an experiment? An experiment is another way for us to answer the questions. It's not what we are, what the user really answer. I, I, I discussed it in my book when talking about Fisher. That he discussed, the, he wanted to ask the question that a farmer asked in England in this uh, particular situation, which fertilizer should we use for my luck? And I don't care about randomized experiment. The farmer was not ab about to conduct a randomized experiment. Randomized experiment was a, a roundabout way of emulating what the farmer really wanted to, uh, to ask. What fertilizer is better, this one or this one? Which means, what will be my yield if I use fertilizer one throughout my lot versus my yield if I use fertilizer two throughout my life? No randomized experiment, no lot. So now you're telling me, go back and think in terms of the randomized experiment you emulate. I don't buy it if I can answer the farmer directly from the knowledge that I have. Why mutilate it with another stage and go to the uh, what they call emulated um, uh, target experiment? Okay, I don't want target experiment. I want target answer. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, just uh, this is second last question uh, uh, Briar yeah hi uh, again just a general question this was triggered by the one about cycles and graphs I'm curious about um, just a general treatment of incorporating the time into causal diagrams and you know time as a variable in, in causal inference yeah, time is a variable, no, I don't know for me, but in terms of sequential graph, that's what we have done with the Bayesian network uh, in, in, in time sequencing. <clears throat> you simply segment the time into increment and discretize the time and you build a new graph, one graph per time slot, and then you connect them. And, and, and but really, you want to answer the question in terms of a, a global happening. What happens if I manipulate this variable? What, okay. The semantics will be a sequence of graphs. The questions and the answers that you want will be taking into account this sequential graph, but answering them in terms of cause and effect as if they were done simultaneously. But, so we have a semantics for that. It's not easy to handle a sequence of graphs because you have to be careful about the relationship between them, but it's, it's done. It has been done in the, in the literature on Bayesian network. It's called sequential, um, sequential decision. Yeah, thank you, that's, that's very helpful. Um, Werner, Berlin. No. So, <clears throat> if not, uh, I would like to thank Professor Pearl for so uh, exciting talk and then uh, having him respond to all the questions. 
it's I like uh, me <laughs> <laughs> It is right now 2.37 and uh, oh, wow. I'm I so grateful uh, for him to stay here uh, to answer all the questions. Uh, we are lucky to have him and this recording will be available on YouTube. I will be sending this uh, email either late tomorrow, uh, late today or early tomorrow. So you will have the access to the video recording and uh, yeah, let's thanks uh, uh, Professor Pearl uh, for the wonderful thank talk you. and uh, one, uh, wonderful discussion. Thanks for having me and for listening so patiently. Uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Great.